Dr. Usmani. We have been blessed by an outpouring of new drugs this year. It's amazing how many new drugs have uh, come uh, uh, just in uh, the myeloma space. Um, we're a 1% disease, and and for me, that's amazing that people like yourself would even operate in that uh, in that area because um, you know it's it, there's so many other opportunities out there. But it happens to be one of the most difficult and most promising, and 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 I think uh, for most people, uh, just a, a challenge. And uh, thank you for being there. But but what are the drugs and and what are those drugs and the combination of those drugs which you see have the most promise for the future? Um, Gary, this is uh, truly an exciting time to be a myeloma researcher. Um, uh, despite our challenges of still understanding and grasping the disease biology, um, we have been. Um, um, you know, very uh, successful and, and fortunate in many ways to to have the ability to investigate, uh, you know, several different mechanisms of actions or drug classes in myeloma today. Um, and I think with these new drug approvals, I think we're still uh, scratching the surface. Um, even though we have, you know, nine drugs that have been approved um, in myeloma and uh, four last year, um, uh, we have to appreciate that, uh, you know, even though these are newer drugs, um, um, for the longest time, uh, you know, almost a decade, uh, all we had in terms of novel therapies was a class of drug called EMIT or immunomodulatory drugs and proteasome inhibitors. So what's, what's the most exciting thing um, in the past two or three years as a myeloma researcher and, and um, um, early drug development clinical trialist uh, is that we have new drug classes like HDAC inhibitors um, and then monoclonal antibodies that are targeting specific uh, surface markers and pathways um, that are being developed. Um, so all of those things are, are very exciting. Um, um, you know, the, the senior myeloma researchers um, from the 80s, 90s, and even early 2000s, um, you know, their challenge was... Um, uh, trying to uh, move away from conventional chemotherapies, which cause a lot of side effects, and um, and, and truly uh, move more towards selective uh, therapeutic targets, uh, and trying to improve the side effect profile of of these drugs. So I think we're, we're very fortunate that we are in an era where we have a lot of these therapies um, in development, um, and I'd be happy to elaborate um, on them based on you know. Um, what you would like to ask me? Well, you know, I guess what are the what are the you know there's so many well the four new drugs that came up panabinistat, um, daratumumab, uh, nenlaro. Um, what you know what are the combinations of those drugs uh, uh, that you see that have the most promise for the future? Okay, um, I think. Um, Phenobinostat, um, when it was approved by the FDA, it was approved based on uh, its combination with a proteasome inhibitor, bortezomib. Um, and it, even though it, it had demonstrated uh, overall survival benefit, we were concerned about the side effect or safety profile where we saw a lot of GI side effects um, and, and increased neuro, neuro uh, toxicity effects uh, with that combination. Uh, but um, the bottom line with that combination specifically was that um, that platform worked for patients. Um, combining a proteasome inhibitor and an emit had been for the longest time our, our mainstay for treatment, but now we had a new platform, uh, which is PI combining with a new class of drugs called HDAC inhibitors. So, um, you know, in reality, Panobinostat will probably partner better with um, safer or, or better tolerated proteasome inhibitors. Um, I see for panobinostat, um, the combination with kyprol, kyprolis or carfilzomib will likely be uh, better tolerated, and that's probably where uh, we'll find this, you know, this drug being partnered with. Um, uh, Ninlaro or exasomib uh, is the first 
oral proteasome inhibitor um, that has been approved uh, for patients beyond one prior line of treatment in combination with lenalidomide and dexamethasone. Um, and that provides a very good all oral option for patients where you want to combine um, an image with a proteasome inhibitor um, as their line of treatment. Um, um, you know, elotuzumab, um, uh, which is an antibody targeting um, a surface marker called SLAM F7, um, which is um, um, you know highly uh, expressed by these plasma cells. Um, um, that also got FDA approved um, in a very similar line of of treatment. So so patients who who've had one prior line of treatment up to three prior lines of treatment. The exciting thing about that combination um, is is that elotuzumab, even though it's an antibody and it needs to be infused, it does not have a lot of side effects. And in patients who are responding, uh, we're seeing sustained responses um, um, in a very uh, unique mechanism. So, so the patient's own immune system is being utilized to suppress the myeloma cells and control the disease. And, and that's, uh, that's quite exciting. Um, uh, the fourth... Uh, drug, I believe, um, um, uh, daratumumab um, is probably the most exciting uh, uh, monoclonal antibody um, right now by virtue of its single agent activity um, in patients who have more advanced myeloma, who have had at least um, three prior lines of treatment, um, um, or they have become double refractory, uh, which is, you know, refractory to lenalidomide as well as to bortezomib, um, which again have been our mainstay for um, uh, you know myeloma therapy for over a decade. Um, um, the um, the challenges with daratumumab um, are um, uh, the longer infusion times, especially um, during that first cycle of treatment, um, and and infusion related reactions which may happen in about half of the patients. But mostly those infusion-related reactions are mild and, and easily managed by treatments that, that we would give um, um, for allergic reactions to other monoclonal antibodies that we you know, utilize for diseases like lymphoma. Um, uh, you know, daratumumab is the first monoclonal antibody that actually has single agent activity um, um, in fairly advanced relapsed refractory patients. Um, it had a response rate of um, roughly 31% um, in a combined analysis um, on 148 patients. Um, um, the data were presented at ASH, uh, which would mean that you know, one in three, uh, roughly one in three patients who are receiving this therapy will have benefit. Um, um, and, and the exciting thing about that was, you, know, you have now a monoclonal antibody that has activity on its own. You have a mechanism of action that has activity on its own. You can combine it with a proteasome inhibitor on its own as well as with an imid. So we're moving away from just an imid combination with the proteasome inhibitor. We now have these different drug classes and we can combine these drug classes together um, and, and um, you know, the patient's uh, will continue to benefit from these combinations. Um, so it's, you know, the, the, the overall message that I would like to give, you know, we have all these drugs that are being FDA approved, but the way that we are thinking about these drugs is how do we combine um, specific drugs in a drug class with another drug in, in the next drug class? And, and which patients do we choose um, uh, to go for, for certain combinations. That is something that we as, as myeloma researchers have to work on over the next five years. The uh, checkpoint inhibitors, uh, that's another class of drugs, which is kind of amazing uh, to me, is that we have uh, daratumumab, which is a uh, monoclonal antibody, which is a brand new class of drugs where we had the imids and the protosome inhibitors. Then we have uh, daratumumab, which is a, another class of drugs. And, and this checkpoint inhibitors is another class of drugs as well. So 
um, what uh, what you know what kind of things can you say about that new class, which is uh, the the checkpoint inhibitors, uh, which seems to be a very exciting uh, thing for many um, myeloma researchers. Uh, for sure. I think the checkpoint inhibitors have really changed the landscape of oncology in general. Uh, the early data and excitement started from um, solid oncology research, specifically in metastatic melanoma and metastatic renal cell carcinoma, um, when um, drugs like epilelumab and nivalumab were being evaluated. Um, uh, but now we have drugs like pembrolizumab, um, uh, which have shown, um, you know, um, um, very unique and significant uh, activity in, in solids. The w reason why I say unique, um, essentially you're, you're trying to uh, wake up the immune system, uh, which had become tolerant to these cancer cells, and enable the immune system um, to, to make clonal T cells to go after cancer cells. Um, which is which is very unique, you know. And, um, in a normal person, in a younger person, um, when when these when our body cells are dividing and making mistakes in division, one of the functions of the immune system is to take out the abnormal cells, um, and that's that's one of the functions of of the immune system. But over over time, as we age and our immune system becomes less competent, um, uh, the immune system can become uh, tolerant to these cancer cells, and then eventually these cancer cells can start evading the immune system. Um, and what, what these checkpoint inhibitors are doing is waking the immune system up and activating it to, to try to uh, counter, the, uh, counter the cancer cells. Um, so this mechanism of action in general across the board for cancer is, is very exciting. Um, and we have several clinical trials um, where we're now evaluating monoclonal um, antibodies that are targeting the checkpoint inhibitor, um, um, uh, you know, checkpoint pathway, um, uh, and combining them with um, proteasome inhibitors as well as IMID. Um, um, you know, it's, it's very likely that we will be combining um, some of the monoclonal antibodies that have single agent activity with, uh, with each other. Um, so it's very likely that, that uh, we, we may have an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody being combined with a checkpoint inhibitor uh, in early phase clinical trials. Uh, we've been talking, you know, the my, you know, several myeloma researchers have been talking to different companies um, um, to, to come up with a clinical trial, um, um, uh, you know, with, with that concept in mind. Um, and you can imagine, you know, having the, the advantage with monoclonal antibodies is the, the safety profile um, being very favorable. Um, if we can potentially come up with a two monoclonal antibody combination um, that may benefit our patients uh, from the time of diagnosis onwards and it can keep the disease under check, um, you know, potentially for a long time. Um, um, so there is a lot of excitement there. Well, thank you, Doctor. Of these new combinations and uh, drugs, do you see any which uh, are effective used uh, used on patients with high risk multiple myeloma? And I know that you know that's one of the things that uh, you're very much involved in is uh, the high risk multiple myeloma, and that's kind of uh, the area where we, as cancer patients. Uh, understand that ultimately we all end up at is uh, no matter how we start we end up high risk and and if you if you don't si solve high risk then uh, if ultimately uh, you know, we pay the price so do you see anything there uh, um, for sure the way the way that I would explain this um, is as follows um, we have in the past developed myeloma therapies um, in a normal plasma cell biology way. Um, so when the proteasome inhibitors were developed, um, we understood that the proteasome is very important for the plasma cell, a normal plasma cell. Um, um, and if you shut the proteasome factory down, then you can kill a normal plasma cell. 
Um, so we we took that concept and applied it to malignant plasma cells when we developed the proteasome inhibitors. Um, then as we started to become more savvy, we started to think of uh, specific pathway-driven therapy. So uh, if you recall, there were FGFR3 inhibitors being evaluated in clinical trials for myeloma. Uh, there are AKT inhibitors being evaluated for clinical trials in myeloma. And what, what that that approach is trying to do is go after the biology of the malignant plasma cells. So that's the second category of, of the way that we are approaching treating, you know, developing treatments for myeloma. Pick out the pathways that are active in specific patients and try to develop a, uh, a drug that can target that specific pathway in a malignant plasma cell. Uh, the unique thing about the monoclonal antibodies, however, is the monoclonal antibodies generally don't care what's going on inside the myeloma cell. They are going to go after what's on the myeloma cell's surface. Um, so if the cell has CD38 overexpression, um, the, myeloma, uh, the monoclonal antibody is going to tag that plasma cell and, and try to take it out through its three or four different mechanisms. Um, so the reason why, why I'm, I'm bringing that up is um, there is a lot of excitement about the activity of monoclonal antibodies uh, in high-risk patients. Uh, the reason why high-risk myeloma becomes high-risk is because of the genomic chaos that's going on inside um, the myeloma cell. And if we are developing strategies that um, do not care what's happening inside the myeloma cell, but are going to be engaging the bone marrow microenvironment and the immune system um, to go after the myeloma cell, regardless of whatever pathways are active inside that cell, then that's a very different way of looking at uh, treating a particular disease. Um, so I, I truly believe that, that uh, with um, some of these monoclonal antibodies that are in clinical development, um, uh, that we will have uh, good meaningful activity in high risk disease um, we will we are hoping to partner some of these monoclonal antibodies with available platform drugs for high risk myeloma patients um, the swag 1211 trial was the first um, um, you know nci uh, mandated swag uh, cooperative group run clinical trial that combined elotuzumab for high risk patients with RVD. Um, um, that particular trial uh, is now opening two new arms, um, hopefully later this summer, where one of the arms will be KRD and the other will be KRD daratumumab. And, and what we're hoping to see is, um, you know, um, uh, meaningful long lasting uh, responses. Um, and, and survival outcomes for high-risk patients. Um, again, with, with the caveat that, you know, with daratumumab, we've already seen patients who have um, um, fairly advanced disease with deletion 17P who've um, been through every known available um, uh, FDA-approved option. Um, and patients, um, some of these patients are doing extremely well um, for extended periods of time with single-agent monoclonal antibodies. Well, you know, one of the uh, things that I've noticed, at least um, in my local IMF uh, support group, is that, um, like you mentioned, 17P. Um, um, it seems like uh, Linolaro um, was one drug that seemed to be very effective against, you know, that particular a chromosomal abnormality, and uh, and she had, you know, given the fact that 17P, the average life expectancy for high-risk patients is about two years, has consistently been that, she had like three or four years on just in LARO, and then recently went on another clinical trial, which was, uh, I think, ABT199, and and her uh, myeloma is undetectable. So that, that I thought, was amazing. Yeah, so ABT199 is, is another exciting, um, you know, class of drugs. It's a, 
BCL2 inhibitor. Um, and, um, you know, uh, with, with terms, you know, coming back to, you know, I'll, I'll try to come to Nellaro first, and, you know, it's, that, that is a phenomenal response, um, um, and um, the way that most myeloma experts think of Nellaro um, is an oral proteosome inhibitor f uh, first in its class, but perhaps in terms of efficacy, uh, it may not be able to overcome the high-risk features um, of uh, P53 deletion um, or translocation 414 uh, on its own. It can certainly um, improve the outcome, but it cannot overcome the poor prognostic um, 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 you know, uh, features that are confirmed, uh, conferred by translocation 414. Um, we feel that it, in terms of its activity, it's very similar to bortezomib um, uh, because it, again, belongs to the same class. Um, uh, it's structurally very similar, um, and, and we do not see it as being um, more efficacious um, than bortezomib. So in terms of activity, it's going to be, um, you know, what we feel is about the same. If we had done a clinical trial looking at, RVD versus RD, um, I think RVD would have uh, fared, um, um, you know, comparatively, um, um, you know, would have been comparable to IRD um, in the eventual outcome analysis. Um, uh, but having an oral uh, regimen with better side effect profile to bortezomib is, is what is, um, um, you know, the, the better... Um, uh, measure of, of exasomib's advantage. You know, it is an oral agent. It causes less neuro, neuropathy than bortezomib. Um, we've known that bortezomib can help, uh, or proteasome inhibitor emit combination can help improve the outcomes um, in some trans, uh, TP53 or, or P53 deleted patients, uh, as well as translocation 414 patients. Um, but we also know that, that yes, there is some benefit but the poor prognostic implications aren't overcome. Um, so we still need to do a better job uh, in finding better answers and combinations for high-risk disease. Um, these anecdotal experiences tell you about how heterogeneous the disease is. Um, there are patients who have P53 disease uh, who can actually do extremely well. The percentage of that, those patients is very low, but there are patients who can have extended survivals with even the standard available therapies. Well, thank you, doctor. I um, I just think it's amazing how many uh, and what a team uh, exists in the myeloma space. And I, I mean uh, the doctors, uh, the researchers, uh, the IMF, the MMRF, uh, and uh, the myeloma advocates, you know, and 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 how you guys have done such a great job and 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 coming up with one third of all cancer drugs for a one percent disease. It's crazy, um, you know. It's it's it, to me, it's a myeloma miracle, and uh, and I thank you and and all the people who who contribute to that. Um, we have nine major drugs uh, prior to this year uh, for multiple myeloma, and now we have four more. Uh, basic math, you know, tells me there are 511 possible combinations with nine drugs and an astounding 8,191 possible combinations with 13 drugs. <laughs> how, does, how does any specialist navigate this kind of complexity? Um. The way that I would, um, you know, I, I would reiterate some of the messages that I've tried to give early. Um, the way that we are thinking of these drugs is by drug class. So, you know, within the image we have thalidomide, which uh, we don't, uh, which is FDA approved, but, you know, has, um, doesn't have as much use here in the United States anymore than it does in Europe. Then we have um, lenalidomide and pomalidomide. Uh, each with its own um, 
utility in in a certain line um, you know line uh, line or, or setting in myeloma then we have the proteosome inhibitors bortezomib carfilzomib and exazomib um, um, the HDAC inhibitors we have one drug class um, with an anti CD38 um, it's daratumumab right now but isatuximab which is um, a Sanofi drug it's not far behind um, with anti slam of seven antibody we have elotuzumab um, the way that that we're thinking of combining these drugs again is you know for the upfront patients um, we still think of patients in a transplant eligible or ineligible way um, so we're trying to combine the best therapies to er eradicate the disease as much as possible um, um, in in all patient groups but to get to that point we still have to combine these therapies um, uh, in a disease you know in a meaningful way uh, we cannot do this um, in a in a our cancer and total therapy way where we are throwing all these drugs so we have to be a little thoughtful um, and as we think about disease we also have to think about cost um, so the way that we are approaching treatments you know we already have this platform of proteosome inhibitors and imids that we have been using along with steroids um, we have to think of partnering the best agent that will give us uh, the best response um, uh, for for this class of uh, you know uh, for different classes of drugs um, for transplant eligible patients um, we're thinking of combining uh, monoclonal antibodies with the three drug combinations um, like RVD um, or carfilzomib or KRD for transplant ineligible upfront patients, um, um, bortezomib or lanlidomide are being combined with monoclonal antibodies in the upfront setting. Uh, the idea is to improve the depth of response and survival outcome. When patients are relapsing, one of the things that, that we're looking at is prior treatments received, um, what kind of responses patients had to those treatments, what kind of side effects they had to those treatments, and what are the disease features at relapse, um, whether it's a biochemical relapse or a clinical relapse. And, and you know, it's not a simple decision, um, um, honestly. It, it, it is a very personalized decision that has to be made for each patient. Um, one key element um, that we are starting to grasp now um, uh, in a better way is that you know we've been approaching myeloma treatment um, in a one size fits all way for a long time but myeloma is biologically a very heterogeneous disease it's very likely um, that you know the 25,000 uh, odd patients that are diagnosed with myeloma every year um, they belong to 10 different categories biologically and it's very likely that each of those biologic categories are going to respond to different drugs in different ways. Um, we have to tease that out so that we can make the best decisions for our patients. Um, um, so, you know, you've rightly said, I mean, how does any myeloma specialist navigate this complexity? Um, um, we are still trying to figure that out. It's not an easy answer. <laughs> well, thank you, doctor. And, and, and 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 I often say, you know, to uh, people who write me on, you know, my my blog, myelomasurvival dot com, that uh, you need a doctor who uh, is right in the the mix of it uh, to even attempt to navigate through such a minefield of possibilities. Uh, you know that you're just you're, you're you, uh, and I think I think it was Dr. Uh, Palumbo who said that if uh, if your doctor doesn't see hundreds of patients with multiple myeloma, that uh, that uh, they really aren't in a position to treat the disease because it's that complex. Uh, I agree with Antonio's comments there. Um, uh, the challenge in the United States um, is not every region has uh, a myeloma specific um, uh, program. Um, um, 
you know, eventually I think we will get there. Um, uh, but for, for patients who are listening to this um, uh, show and, um, you know, who, who are being treated by um, a local oncologist and, and uh, you're not close to a myeloma center, um, it's totally okay to continue your care with your current doctor if, if you, you are comfortable, but do seek out an opinion from a myeloma expert uh, who lives close to you and have them um, as a backup uh, to to look over things. Um, this is something that, that I keep on stressing. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, the way that the field is changing, um, you have to have a myeloma expert in your back pocket um, who can um, help guide things, especially uh, with subsequent lines of treatment.